Hey, Sebash. Um, hi there. And I suppose, first of all, I'll just say congratulations to all of you on the creation of Woo! pretty awesome new meetup group. In, uh, Thank you. Well, it's a beautiful part of the world that one day I hope to be visiting in person, not virtually from my show. <laughs> uh, it's nice, good. It is really, really good to see how Agile and, and Scrum and, and just communities in general are, are still continuing to grow because, you know, I think one thing that's been really, really important over the last 12 months or so has been communities, um, supporting each other uh, and growing. So yeah, good, good for you in putting your effort into this. I know how, how much effort goes into organizing things like this firsthand. So uh, good for you for, for doing this. And, and thanks for the introductions. So yeah, I'm Jeff. Um, as I was saying to a few people um, before we actually started, um, someone spoke to my wife yesterday and said, oh, I hear your husband, uh, he writes books. And she was sort of taken back and said, well, yeah, 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 he has written books, but that's not what he does. Um, he's just happened to have written a few things. So yeah, most of my time is not spent writing books, I can assure you. Um, it, is, it is doing this, what, uh, what Subash said, organic coaching, organic leadership, organic agility. And actually, you, you described it. Basically, it's helping organizations create a more resilient culture. Um, so meeting them where they are and helping them just basically become a little bit more resilient, a little bit more agile over time. Uh, Claire, however, has a real job. Um, <laughs> I don't know about Claire, that. Claire basically makes stuff, all right? She, uh, she, she helps people make stuff. She, she's a VP of engineering at a company that I personally have used for... I would say 10 years or so uh, and even got my most recent order from them just yesterday so they were an online printing and design company really awesome company really fun place to work and as well as all the other things that Claire has to do in her job she's spending a lot of time recently been thinking about well what's the next iteration of our working environment because it's going to continue to evolve not just at her company but but elsewhere and we're calling it Work 2.0, but depending on, I don't know, where you are, where, what your company's doing, it might be 3.0, 4.0, even 20.0 by now. I don't know, but you know, things have changed a lot and they're continuing to change, and I think they're going to uh, carry on changing for a long time. And I think one thing that we probably can be certain of, regardless of where you're joining us from in the world, and I, I see in the chat we've got people from all over the world, um, is that your world of work and probably how you live will have been seriously disrupted over the last 12 or so months. And it's been a, you know, it's been a shift that it's probably unlikely to ever go back to the same again. And everybody's probably been affected slightly differently. You know, for most of us, it's probably been a mixture of some mild inconveniences and some incredibly unsettling disruptions possibly with the odd pleasant surprise thrown in as well. So we're going to see if we can gauge your personal experiences already over the last 12 months. We're going to, we've got a, a Slido poll running. Uh, I say we. Claire is the technical genius amongst the two of us, so she's organised all this. Um, so what we want to do is we want to hear a little bit from you about what you're doing differently now as a result of the shift that we've all experienced in how we work over the last 12 months. So how this works is you can scan that QR code or you can just go to slido.com in your web browser and type in that code. And you should see either on your mobile device or your web browser, this question, how has work changed for you? What are you doing differently now compared to a year ago? It's completely free form. So you can type as you would speak and we'll just, we should see what's coming in on the screen. So let's see what you're doing differently. Staying at home. Yep, me too. Some yep, room. getting better at facilitation. Yeah. Yeah. Working remotely, a lot of that. Wearing tracksuit bottoms. You can't see what I'm wearing. I'm wearing tracksuit bottoms. It's the classic <laughs> joke, isn't it? It's the, the, the news reading, you don't know what's going on underneath the desk, but I can assure you I'm wearing jeans. Uh, enjoying time with my kids. More asynchronous work. We're going to talk a lot about asynchronous talk about work later on. 
um, trying harder to connect, whether that's uh, connecting to the internet or not, or whether it's connecting to people, I don't know. Uh, having having naps. I'm so with that person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> virtual meetings, having naps. Yeah, I'm a big fan of a nap. I'm told I should stop, but I like it. No control over personal time. Yeah, that's going to be challenging. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Making more use of Kindle books. More, mm. Less sun, less sand. That's sad. I've no commuting. That's a good one. Yep, I'm enjoying having no commute. Yeah, no commute. Started freelance training. So it's uh, hugging my dogs way more. Can't beat that, really, sure. Too much screen time. Yeah. And it's uh, not something we can just whinge to our kids about. We're kind of guilty of that ourselves now as much as, uh, as, much as our kids are saying can you hear me yeah are you on mute those three in the middle working longer hours working remotely remote facilitation those are the, the really popular ones and they are going to form quite a big part of the theme of, of what we're going to be talking about today not wearing shoes interesting or socks i love that no socks yeah. Well, I can if I'm on holiday. I've always got shoes. Okay, cooking more, lots of webinars. No commute, less commute, lots of meetings. Sleeping later. More control over our free time. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for that. We're going to have another Slido poll later on. So uh, we've proven that we can make it work. We've proven that there are people out there. Yep, we are interacting and responding with each other, which is great. Um, so yeah, um, some really interesting in insights there, isn't there? You know, um, lots of different different things cropping up, and you know, showing that things have have changed changed for uh, changed for us all. So I thought I'd kick off the sort of presentation part of this uh, this session with a with a quote. You know, it's always always good to do that. Um, you know, this one from the New York the New York Times, um, which just you know goes to show that we're that, you know, this community is not alone. Uh, many many others have had to uh, had to adapt as well. Um, you know, we might all not necessarily be in the same boat, but we're we're certainly experiencing the same the same storm. And uh, you know, the, the vast majority of people don't go want to go back to what we what we had before. You know. The, the majority of the comments were coming through there were, were, were positive actually you know there's pros and cons to this and, and you know lots of people although we want to get out of the pandemic and out of lockdowns and the like we don't want everything to go back to the the way the way it was before so i can see some uh, some real change happening over the over the next decade you know we're going to see companies adapting um, and making the switch from being uh, uh, fully in the office to hybrid or semi-remote and maybe even fully uh, fully remote because yeah, people just don't want to go back to what it was before. You have know, all seen the the benefits of doing things in a different a different way, and we've had our eyes open to the to the possibilities. So you know, people are going to want to make choices based on their own needs, and and demand a level of flexibility. To be uh, to be perfectly honest, and you know the companies that can that can offer that that flexible uh, approach are going to be the ones that are going to attract the best talent, and and in turn they will they will thrive. Um, so Jeff and I are going to spend the next, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes talking through some eight predictions, uh, hopefully to provoke some some thought and get your uh, get your minds worrying a little bit. And then we'll come back to a bit a bit more discussion and, and question at the at the end of this. So I shall kick off and well, Jeff and I are going to talk through talk through our eight predictions of um, next. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've just said that. So yeah, here are our predictions on how it's all going to work. So the first one, uh, company clubhouses. So, you know, most of our companies um, probably had uh, you know, reasonable offices in the uh, in the past. Uh, you know, they might have been big or they might have been small. Moose certainly had a very grand office in the uh, in the in the middle of, of, of London. You know, it could accommodate 250, 300 people. But I think going forward, as we as we start working in uh, working in a different way, that we're going to see much smaller uh, offices and uh, complexes where there are more more uh, more collaboration. So you have people that are going into the office one or two days a week. Um, and it will make these uh, these smaller club-like offices more vibrant. You know, it'll be much more about social social connection. So yeah, I'm, I'm envisaging uh, that these to be more like resorts. 
So yeah, you'll have employees popping in uh, once or twice a week, and it'll all be about collaboration. You know, rather than you won't be going into the office to sit there with your headphones on uh, to do your work. You're going to be going in to collaborate with your colleagues, and you know these spaces are going to be outstanding. You know, they'll be they'll be providing the best um, uh, employee experiences. You know, we'll have great remote working facilities, awesome uh, video conferencing facilities, um, and you know there'll be things going on in and around uh, in the morning and the evening as well. You know, encourage. And encouraging people to come in and use that space for for things beyond uh, beyond uh, beyond work as well. So encouraging uh, uh, moments of planned serendipity. So what might that look like? You know, I think more business lounge rather than uh, rather than Google Campus, um, but yeah, something more more like like this type of space rather than lots and lots of uh, offices, uh, lots and lots of people crammed in on banks and banks of desks. So yeah, I can see spaces being split between collaborative working uh, slash meeting rooms. Uh, you know, with, with some really uh, brilliant technology and, and log logistics to make that in person experience am amazing. You know, if you're going to go into the office to collaborate with someone. You'll have everything that you need uh, at your fingertips to do so. You know, be be that unlimited um, supplies of uh, post-it notes and sharpies, or um, or your yeah, high-quality video conferencing uh, facilities for you to engage with people. So yeah, the working lounges will replace, or I think working lounges will replace rows and rows and banks of desks. You know, I don't think we will go into the office anymore and, and see that type of environment where you walk in and there are tons and tons of desks. I think it will be more touched down areas, hot desk in business lounges, you know, so you can sit down and, 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 uh, and, and talk with someone uh, for shorter periods, of, uh, shorter periods of time before you're up and off again. Um, and of course, uh, uh, people will want to do some work in, in the office as well. I think there will be um, you know, dedicated quieter zones for people to do that and them being a much more smaller, uh, smaller proportion than they, than they are today. Um, and yeah, I, I, can, I can envisage a, a much bigger investment in uh, areas such as company all hands. You've again, put an investment into, into, into technology and immersive, immersive experiences. So you're building uh, like a cinema-like experience or a restaurant-like experience. Um, you might even have food, food and drink available. You know, and the, these are spaces that are going to be big enough to accommodate a, a whole company to come into the office if, if, uh, if required, um, which also makes them quite flexible, flexible spaces to be used for other purposes as well. You know, if you want to have yoga classes in the morning or uh, movie nights in the uh, in the evening, you know that, that there is the, these spaces can be uh, can be flexible uh, for that as well, which means that these will become social hubs not just for employees but other visitors as uh, other visitors as well. You know, it might start becoming normal to be bringing your bringing your family to work rather than rather than just working uh, working from home. So that's my first prediction: uh, smaller club like spaces. So my second one is uh, is asynchronous working. Um, and, you know, this is uh, maybe maybe not a big surprise, but I, I really do think async is a, async is a future. You know, if we're only going to be in the office a couple of days a week, then you know what's going to change the change the rest of the the rest of the time. You know, asynchronous working, a way where you're communicating with people without expecting an immediate response is going to be key. And I, you know, I really think it's one of the most underrated and important factors in, in uh, team productivity and remote and hybrid teams. You know, as, as we've gone through the pandemic, many companies have just tried to replicate what, they, what they're doing in the, uh, in the office whilst working from home. <laughs> and you know, let's face it, for many companies, that was, a, that was actually a big step. Um, but you know, we're going to have to go beyond that if we, if we want to get better. You know, large amounts of real-time communications via via, uh, via video call can be uh, can be drain, uh, draining, and it's not it's not really required in reality. You know, there's lots of other other ways for us to communicate if you put a bit more thought into it. So yeah, I think we we do need to put more thought and effort in how to how we teams communicate and work in a in an asynchronous manner. And you know, this is really going to be a game changer. Um, and I think we're going to see a, a, a you know a burst of uh, new tools emerging to support us doing this. Um, you know, be, there'll be way more things available than than Slido and, and Zoom. I don't even know what they will be yet, but there's going to be tons of them for us to assess, investigate, try out, uh, test out at meetups, and uh, and and uh, experiment and learn and fail. And it means that you know uh, leaders, managers, and coaches and organisations are going to have to like sort of keep keep up with the learning curve and learn learn all these new techniques to support their uh, support their support their teams. 
So here's, um, just to sort of put that into practice a little bit, here's a, a communications pyramid. And I'm actually in the process of building one of these for uh, one of these for Moo. But this one's from a company called uh, called Doist, where they've modeled out the different tools that they're using for different asynchronous and uh, asynchronous uh, uh, communications. So I think every company is going to need to put some thought into, uh, you know, which method is, is most important for which type of work and provide guidance to uh, employees on, on tooling and the best method me best methods to do it. You know, I think over time, as people get more accustomed to these methods, the volume of synchronous work will, uh, uh, will, will decline anyway. Um, as people you know, get more comfortable with doing do things asynchronously, they'll, they'll uh, see the benefit of the flexibility of doing, thing, uh, doing things in an async, uh, in an async manner. Um, and I think uh, you know leaders or uh, you know coaches, managers that, that are struggling to do this are going are going to find this really really hard. Um, you know, think that you know that uh, it'll be a, a real change for for some people. But you know, in reality, I think the you know these these pyramids need to be uh, moving more uh, to be doing as much as we can in a in a synchronous a synchronous manner. So related but slightly different is narrative building. Um, so you know, I've been trying to do some more asynchronous communications in my in my my work already, and uh, you know trying to do more in the written format and sending pre-reads out and the like. And I've you know I've realised that the, the tone in my written communications can be can come across a bit cynical and, and negative sometimes, as my as my boss going as my boss could tell you, you know. So it's a it's a, it's a real it's a real skill, uh, being able to tell a uh, tell a story, and you're. Standing up or speaking up across, uh, you know, verbally is, is one thing, uh, but doing it asynchronously via audio, and audio or the written format is is something completely different again. So when everyone isn't in the office the whole time, you know, com companies are going to have to search for better ways to communicate more effectively. You know, and that storytelling is going to be absolutely vital. You know, be it in the written or the or the verbal format in order to to share company vision and ensure everyone's heading in the in the same direction. You know, that's hard enough to do when we're all in the office, and it'll be even harder working in a in a remote in a remote and hybrid way. But it's, it's vital to make sure everyone's uh, being kept in the loop on what's going on. So I think the most successful leaders and team members will be great writers and they'll be able to do it uh, concisely and they'll be able to capture their, their logic and the written and the written format well. Uh, so your others can consume and, con and contribute uh, to that in, a, in an, as an asynchronous uh, manner. You know, I think tools that, are, that will enable others to do this are going are gonna to explode. Um, there'll be lots and lots of different ways to, to, uh, to help us get better at this. I mean, another sort of method is, is podcasts. You know, here's an example from uh, from from Trader Trader Joe's. You know, text based and video based uh, can cause a lot of stress. You know, information uh, information overloads. So I think we'll need to think about using a different mix of channels and different. Uh, different methods. So you know, something like a, an internal company podcast um, could be a way uh, could be a way to do that. And your yeah, trader trader Joe's have a, a really popular and effective one there as a, as an example. Um, but I, I also think things like async audio or short video clips will become become really popular. You know, uh, Clubhouse as an example of, uh, of 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 async has already been popularised, and I've. I've started trying to use uh, Loom a little bit and um, with my long-winded pre-reads sending a 30 to 60 minute um, video clip to uh, convey the sentiment of what I'm trying to uh, trying to get across uh, so people can uh, get, people can under understand it whilst they're, whilst they're uh, reading it asynchronously. So yeah, narrative building and storytelling is going to be really, really important. Right, now I'm going to hand over to Jeff to tell you, uh, to talk to you a little bit more about uh, outcomes and outputs. Yeah, cool. So one of the things that I've really noticed since the pandemic started is that I've seen the difference between the companies that really took Agile seriously and those that didn't, because it's really forced companies to accept and acknowledge something that a lot of us have been pushing for for a long time. And the companies that really did get the fact that it's not about how long you work, but what comes out of it they've actually really thrived in the pandemic because they've already built trusting relationships with autonomous people and autonomous teams. The organisations that perhaps were paying lip service to it, they've had to play real catch up or revert back to real micromanagement. And, you know, in the knowledge economy, the complex environment that most of us are operating in, simply just working eight hours doesn't guarantee success. Doing something for longer 
doesn't correlate with higher output. And this has really, really magnified that for many organizations. I think that's a good thing. And so because of this, hopefully, more companies are realizing that more employees need to have greater control of how they do their work. And so the best workers, they're going to be attracted to the organizations that really do trust their people, that really do let them design their work day to be most effective. And they're going to focus on what they produce, not on how long they're working or how many lines of code they're creating. It doesn't matter when they do it, how they do it, they just do it. They don't need to worry about padding out their timesheets. Um, and so you're probably gonna see a lot more focus on, there'll probably be better things than this in the future, but things like OKRs and CFRs, things like that, they are going to be focused on trying to support people who are focusing on outcomes rather than output. And that's really important because not, I mean, this is, these stats here are taken from the UK, but I don't think they're too unrepresentative of the world. We spend a lot of our time at work and we all need a better way to manage that. So if we've got much more freedom to choose how we're going to do our work, and we don't have to worry about coming into an office from nine to five simply because that's how things have always been done in the industrialized world, then we can start thinking about our work as one big value stream. We can almost do a value stream mapping exercise on our working day, our working week, and start thinking, well, how much of our time is actually value add? How much of it is metaphorically banging our head against the wall or overhead or waste or frustration and you think of, think of a lot of the overtime that we do so you can see 204 days overtime a lot of that historically is because we're not very good at getting to outcomes and our major compensation is extra output that's all we can do we'll just work longer we'll try and catch up or prove that we work really hard um, and that has really, I think we saw this in some of the comments in the Slido poll, that's really only got worse in the last 12 months. We've, it's been harder to stop work. And when we're unsure about whether we're hitting our goals or we're unsure about what people are thinking of us, whether they suspect we're slacking, it's much easier to just log on again and do a, do a little bit more because we've got all the stuff here, it's there, but the, the boundaries are so blurred. And that has for many of us led to a decline in our health and well-being. Now, well-being is, is sort of hot topic at the moment, um, and rightly so, because it's not all about the work. The good news is, and again, this came out in the Slido poll, but we've got less commuting time. So we're not spending two hours, three hours a day on the train or commuting to work. So we've got more flexibility in how we which should mean that we've got more time for health and well-being. And I personally know people who are going out for you know, a run in the middle of the day, or they are being there for, for childcare. They, sometimes we've had to because we've been homeschooling, so it obviously hasn't been truly remote or homeworking, but we've been integrating our work and our lives rather than trying to balance them. Normally you'd hear about work-life balance. This is a little bit more about work-life integration, if you like. How can, we, how can we build our working life around our personal life? And I think companies, we're starting to see that. We're starting to see them recognize that, not just from a well-being perspective, but seeing the opportunities they've got. So we're seeing different kinds of benefits packages, for example, to, you know, to match the perks that our new lifestyle is giving us. So we don't need to worry about um, some of the previous things that would be quite attractive to us. We're seeing things like mandatory breaks, days off, you know, extra, not public holidays, but private holidays to make sure that we are striking a pretty good energy balance and make sure that we're not burning out, that we're not blurring those boundaries. We're seeing organisations turn off email servers between certain times, you know, having sort of blackouts for periods so that people aren't able to just 
go on and do emails in the middle of the night. Um, I, I think we're probably going to see more of that kind of stuff, sort of flexible mix and match benefits, you know, things like um, subscriptions to Headspace and I don't know, Disney Plus or you know, health food subscriptions, things like that. And instead of your cycle to work subsidies, you're probably going to get cycle at home subsidies. You know, we've, I've, I've seen organisations that are providing Peloton subscriptions and the like to enable people to uh, work and live healthier and more mindfully. I've, I haven't yet got it. You can't see under my desk, but someone I know who has, has had for a while a, a mini treadmill underneath their desk. So they're sort of in their meetings and they're walking, they're getting their 10,000 steps in a day on their treadmill. I quite like the idea of that. I know people who've got their sort of indoor, uh, I can't remember the name of it, basically an indoor exercise bike and they're cycling at a relatively pedestrian pace, but they're still exercising while they're in meetings. They're a little bit wobbly, but you know, they're, they're integrating things, which I think you're going to see more of. The other thing I think you're going to see more of is um, changes in where we live and, and how we live. Now, my daughter is currently trying, bless her, to finish her A-level exams. And you know, these are the exams that would get her into university if she wants to go to university. I, I really feel for her because not only has she turned 18 during the pandemic, which you can't get back again, she's trying to do, she's trying to navigate this really stressful time of these really important exams through a massive amount of upheaval and uncertainty where she's been you know, sometimes trying to study at home with an 18 month old toddler running around creating havoc um, and her brother hogging the, the bandwidth with playing Fortnite, right? But she's also thinking about, well, where am I going to live? You know, she's going to be leaving home. So am I going to be moving to a city where that's where, all the, that's where all the jobs are? But it's so different. We could be potentially about to see the biggest urban rural shift for over a generation okay this could be absolutely huge it might not be but it could be there's already been a greater shift towards the local and away from the regional and the global i think it's probably going to increase even more because people are going to reclaim that commute time and they won't want to give that up again they're going to connect more with the people and the environment around them you know it's only really been through this pandemic time that I've really spoken to the people who live near me because I've been here more. Um, and at the moment, not everybody lives somewhere with a spare room that they can use as an office, right? They didn't buy their house thinking I'm going to be working from home more. And so equally, a lot of people haven't got their own garden, green space, you know? So I think there's going to see more people move out of those big cities towards the suburbs, the small cities, the villages, it's a lower cost of living at the moment, although if the demand is higher in those places, it won't last that way. But a higher quality of life, you know, properties with a garden and a spare room. So we're probably going to see some more small cities emerge. Um, and because of that, we're going to see infrastructure investment. So faster internet, better schools, because more people are going to be moving there. Myself, I live in a town, not a city, over 100 miles away from London. We've get, we're having two or three new schools being built right now. We're having our infrastructure upgraded simply because we're having a new cyber hub built here, which would typically have been built somewhere closer, say, to London, like Reading or something like that. But it's being built in a little town called Cheltenham, 100 miles away from London. And we've had this neighbourhood plan come through recently, which is the result of the collaboration between the people behind the cyber park and the local neighbourhoods talking about how they're going to create this new village, this, this neighbourhood plan, this, this park, that's going to accommodate more interesting and new and uh, futuristic working, but also benefit the local community with sort of, as you can see on there, public art and different traffic and sports and leisure and play. And it's, this is, this is, there's going to be a lot more of that, right? I even know of a few people who've sold up, sold their houses, bought an RV and turned it into their portable home office. And they're taking this opportunity to be a truly flexible worker, right? So I don't think that that's going to be really rare. I think that's going to be, become more common. You're probably even going to see little temporary workspace campuses for, for things like, you know, maybe RVs or something like that springing up. So 
you know, traveling the world, traveling the area and working wherever we are. So those are some of my predictions. Yeah, and this leads, leads me nicely onto the last uh, the last couple. So you know, if we've, we've started, uh, you're getting getting smaller. You go from big cities into little cities and local areas, maybe even a, an RV. Let's zoom it back out again. Um, you know, I think there will also be you know this will make the the workforce more fluid in general. You're going to have other people that want to want to explore the explore the the whole world. Um, so yeah, I expect to see uh, countries offering remote working visas, uh, be that on a full or, or remote time uh, part-time basis you know to attract people to the local area and boost and boost their economy you know th this is already happening um you know I, I had a, a quick uh, a quick google this morning and i found 16 different countries already doing this you know from the caribbean to uh, to croatia I don't know if mauritius is offering one yet maybe 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 in the future who knows um but yeah, i think companies that, that the chat saying they are and you get a free vaccine when you do yeah, there we go. There we go. I shall be checking it out once we once we finish this. But yeah, I can see this happening more and more. You know, the workforces are more fluid. You know, pe people are looking for different different ways to build communities and and, and boost the local economies. And 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 yeah, all of us are realising we're, we're a little bit less tethered uh, to to a space. Uh, and you know, not everybody's going to want to up, up sticks and move and and uh, you know live in an RV or whatever. Um, but having some flexibility is a huge, huge perk. And you know, I like, think uh, companies that can offer these types of benefits for you know digital digital nomads that have less ties to a single a single area, um, you know, so a, a huge opportunity. You know, this doesn't necessarily mean going off and and, and traveling the traveling traveling the world all year round. You know, it might be uh, six six or eight weeks over the over the summer, or you know, going off for the going off for the winter. Um, and, you know, I think you know, I've taken this a stage further. You know, I'm a, I'm a parent myself, so I might I might not be able to take advantage of some of these things. You know, I've still got a growing growing family, but you know, but I'd love to see, um, you know, the world in general start to think about how we could synchronise our education, for example, that would help make that life easier for families to be more fluid in their in these experiences as well. You know, like uh, kids growing up and being able to experience different cultures and different different environments is, a, is an amazing opportunity. So yeah, that's, that's maybe a, a longer term prediction, but it's one that I would uh, one that I would love to see. So yeah, I, I see companies creating um, lots of work from almost anywhere policies. You know, they may give uh, guidance on on when people must be available. For you know, for example, you might want to say you know between uh, uh, two and two and six uh, GMT. You need to be you need to be online in order to to collaborate uh, collaborate with your, your colleagues and your your peers. Um, but outside of that, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, and we're not going to insist on a specific location either. You know, all, all you need is uh, some IT and a, and a stable internet connection at the end of the day. And as long as you're clear on what your outcomes are, how, how you go about doing it and, and where you go about doing it, to, uh, to be honest, is, is, up to, is up to you. So yeah, rather than this being a sort of fully remote, because I think there, there are plenty of companies that, that are not plenty, but there are some companies already offering fully remote, I think. You know, companies that are thinking more about hybrid or semi-remote may, uh, you know, most considering a concept called hall pass, uh, which would be, you know, two, maybe three months a year. You know, I haven't quite figured out the policy, to be honest. Um, but yeah, if you've been with the company for, for a certain amount of time, then you, un you unlock that benefit. And for two or three months of a year, um, you can be more more flexible and uh, and go, go maybe go work somewhere warm and maybe go to Mauritius for the winter or something like that. That, that, that might be my aim for this year. So yeah, digital nomad visas. Um, and yeah, I mean, fr fr from all of this, you know, sort of blew this up, all these, all these, this crazy thinking. But uh, yeah, new rules are gonna are gonna emerge. You know, this is gonna require lots of different ways of working, and companies are gonna need to dedicate uh, roles to own the remote and hybrid working experience for for their for their employees. You know, with much more emphasis on this. So there's going to need to be people dedicated to, to doing it. You know, create, creating these models and coming up with these ideas in the first place is, is, is hard work. And someone's got to think about how to how to do it. I mean, how, how many people are, are working from home right now, not quite sure what their company is going to do in one or you know, a couple of months' time when things start things start locking down. Uh, uh, unlocking, sorry, but you know, the pande pandemic's easing down. There's a lot of a lot of thinking to be done around how how we bring back to work people back to work, not just in a safe manner, but in a you know in a way that they uh, taking advantage of the of the opportunity and then there's you know doing it one off is is just a start isn't it that we'll have incremental improvements we'll have to sustain it we'll have to improve it you know it's got to all be around these in, uh, internal communities regardless of where 
regardless of where the people are. So you know, building a, a great company culture in a, a hybrid and remote environment isn't going to happen by itself. You know, they're going to need to be people there to to nurture it uh, and, and make sure it makes sure it happens. Um, and I don't know about any of you. Maybe you can chuck in the the chat if any of you have seen any uh, any job titles out there of of companies advertising roles like this. But I've started to see a few. Um, and they tend to be HR sort of people management oriented, but I've seen uh, job titles such as community builder, you know, uh, communications uh, helper, facilitator, well-being coaches. You know, I, I see things like this, uh, things like this appearing already. So I can't see the chat to see if any of us have, uh, have, have written anything, but I'll go back and look in a minute. Yeah, but I'll keep you updated. Yeah, keep it going. Yeah, cool. Um, but like the, the whole topic of this talk was, what does this mean for agile coaching? Um, you know, and I, you know, I'm sure all of us are looking forward to the day where we can go back uh, back into the office and and run a workshop where we can throw up post-it notes on a uh, on, on the wall, um, uh, you know, and everybody being engaged and swarming a, swarming around a whiteboard. Um, but you know, it's more it's more likely that these things are going to happen maybe maybe once a week or once a month or once a, once a quarter. Um, but you know, we're, we're, we'll have to think of different uh, different ways to do it. But the you know the thing that I wanted to highlight and uh, you know get us thinking about for the last part of this uh, last part of this discussion is that the agile co coaching competences are very very relevant to all the things that I've just described. You know the you know good agile coaches should have uh, have strong facilitation skills. You know, hopefully we're we're getting upskilled and uh, figuring out how to how to run things uh, run things remotely. You know we can we can teach people how to how to do that. It doesn't always have to be the agile coach that does something. You know we can teach and mentor other people and, and how to do it. And that will be difficult for some people. They might not like adapting to it. They might not. Um, uh, have, think they, they can leave someone to do their, their outcomes by themselves and might want to micromanage them. That's going to require some professional coaching for some folks to help them uh, to help them through that. Um, and you know all of the masteries as well are very, very, very relevant here as well. So you know, you know Jeff was joking earlier about my technical mastery. Um, I don't know if I would call myself a technical master in anything nowadays, but if I can get a Zoom call working over Slido, um, then I'm then I'm doing all right, I guess. But but like that is the type of thing that's going to become uh, become quite important. Just knowing how to knowing how to make these things work and it be it be seamless and being able to you know do some have a backup plan in case uh, in case it goes uh, in case it goes Role. You know the the you know the business mastery angle is is even more important. You know, we're starting to thinking about uh, outcomes over um, over outputs. You know some of the product mastery that we might uh, that we might have some expertise and could come in useful. Read one of Jeff's other books if you're not familiar with that. Boom, nice. Um, and you know, I mean, arguably most important is the transformation mastery. You know, any of us that have started doing more training or working outside and outside of uh, technology, engineering, product teams, and starting to work ac across a whole organisation, organization, um, you know, being a, a change catalyst and a change agent across an organisation and helping them think differently about things is absolutely vital and really important in this world. Um, so I've talked about everything there bar the agile lean practitioner. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not relevant for so some of the, the concepts and principles from the from the manifesto embrace everything that I've just described. So you might not be applying it to a scrum framework or you're working with software engineering teams, but those those practices and principles in the in the manifesto are just just as important. So yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, if we think about new roles emerging, I'm really surprised that we're not seeing industry calling upon our community to, to help more, to be perfectly honest. I'm surprised that we're not seeing more adverts for agile coaches uh, to go and help with, uh, help with some of these problems. Um, so I, th I think us as a community have a, have a job to, to show ourselves off and demonstrate and explain to people the skills that we have. Um, and you'll be that inside your own organization so you can, you can, uh, you can help with things or yes as, as a whole community I think you know, I'd love to um, uh, see us all just shouting about these competencies that we've got and reminding the whole world that we're here to here to help you know because by and large you know, we're, we're, we're all pretty empathetic people uh, I want to I want to I want to help folks at the end of the day don't we 
Right, let's summarise that up a little bit. So we've talked about eight different things, company, company clubhouses, so big, big offices getting smaller and being more, more collaborative, uh, asynchronous working, so there have been lots of different ways of working beyond doing things in an in a, a instant manner like video calls like now, getting much better at our storytelling and doing it in, uh, uh, in ways such as a written format or maybe uh, async audio. You know, really, really thinking about how we how we work for outcomes, and uh, you know, explaining to people what the what the, what the goal is, and giving them the freedom uh, to go off and uh, go off and do it whenever whenever they want, um, which will help all of our health and and well being. Um, you know, being able to have much more flexibility and integrating our work and our lives uh, together is going to be is going to be awesome. You know, and companies will start thinking about how they can adapt their benefits um, packages to do so. We might all start thinking about moving or uh, getting more engaged in our, our local our local community uh, and thinking about what's happening in our, in our immediate surroundings. Um, or maybe we want to start travelling the world a little bit more, um, you know, be that on a full time or a, or a part time basis, maybe taking it, taking advantages of schemes uh, such as Mauritius and going to see different parts of the uh, parts of the world. And yeah, new roles are going to emerge, um, but maybe agile coaches can can fill, fill some of them. So. I think I'm going to pass to pass back to Jeff now to to start start hearing a bit more from you guys on all of this. Well, yeah, we um we want you to to start telling us what you what you think might happen now, what you think you might be interested in doing, what you think other agile coaches have to offer and other change agents have to offer in this space. So we're going back to our Slido poll, and you, when you when you log on now, when you scan the QR code, or you go to the same same page with that same code, you should see a new question. And that question should say, how could your role adapt to this type of environment? So think about how you might be able to proactively evolve your role, how your organization might want you or need you to evolve your role, or perhaps the community around you might want you to evolve your role. How can you and your skill set and your mindset help? See what comes up. Bring some more life coaching in. So we had another comment from Anna Linda in the, in the comment. It feels half your job is already well-being coaching. There is a net quite, I hear a lot of people say, I feel like a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a psychiatrist or a bit of a therapist for my team at the moment. There, there is a lot from a leadership perspective here, whether it's team leadership or organizational leadership in terms of making sure that our people are okay. Learn and apply more about mindfulness. Yeah, this sort of self-management, self-regulation, self-awareness, you know, emotional management, invest in being a better storyteller. We have lots of stories to tell. So we need to practice telling them. Building more human workplaces, contribute in having a more positive work environment in the workplace. Nomad mindset. And maybe define what that is for you. Trusting the team, facilitating social occasions. It's it's um, it's something that can be done. And you know, we had uh, we've had stand-up comedians and singer-songwriters over Zoom, all sorts of social occasions, playing games over Zoom, and, uh, watching Netflix party mode and things like that. Uh, connecting people with their needs. Yes, find out what their needs are, what needs are, are lacking that might be causing you to, to struggle. Meet the needs, free people up. Creating psychologically safe environment. Yeah, we need, we need to feel comfortable to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that this situation is giving us. Uh, that involves trust um, and it involves trusting ourselves and also a little bit of self-discipline as well. Uh, so psychologically safe environment, challenging the non-value add work. You know, that, what, what could we strip out of what we're doing? and focus on our outcomes instead. Facilitation skills, helping people to avoid burnout, listen to them first, creating an environment where people would love to come to work. I think that's, that's, that's gotta be the first thing, isn't it? Create an environment where we want to come back, where we want to get better, where we want to keep going. And a lot of that will come from empathy, not looking for personal gain, Attention to neurodiversity, yeah, in the remote context, absolutely. Good, good, good. What's that? Canva. 
big digital firm in Australia has no agile coaches, but has an entire internal life coaching practice to support staff. Seems they're well ahead of the wellness curve. Good for them. I'm a big fan of Canva as well. I'm, I'm a personal user. My daughter, again, bring my daughter into this, I should probably tell her actually. Um, she was a, a, what do they call her? Um, a, a, a mindfulness mental first aid coach, I think it was. Um, so a lot of the, the students were, were, were given training in uh, mental. Are you the Um. Hey folks, can you have Yeah, so we have someone. On... There we go. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if breaking down how we traditionally think about work will lead to more people actually questioning the value of work and then designing lives that require less work. I think you might be onto something there, at least. That definitely is certainly a conversation worth having. Cool. Mentoring and coaching executives to help them adapt to listening. So yeah, there's a lot more of these these people skills, aren't they? What would typically, in the old days, perhaps be uh, be referred to as soft skills, but um, increasingly important to to increase that sense of connection and support of one another. And it's, I think I've been called lots of things in my life, but I'm generally a, a believer that. If we if we're okay, then we will do good things. So, if I'm seeing dysfunctional behaviour or disruptive behaviour, that is generally a sign of someone's fundamental needs not being met. And if I can help those needs be met, then people will naturally want to be successful. They'll want to thrive. They'll want to have value. So, good, good, good. All right, loads and loads of ideas. Let's yeah. hand back to. Danisha, you can... Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Claire and, and Jeff. It was very um, nice to have you. Uh, all the late in Russia, so we had the, for our first meetup, it was a nice participation. So uh, we came around uh, 35 at some point. So that was good. And uh, it's a very interesting topic. I think it, it reached reach out to a lot of us. I'm already on the meetup, so it's our first inaugural and... Uh, getting some messages so i'm sure to send it across um to you uh for so those who couldn't like stay a bit longer but uh, thanks a lot and uh, it was a very pleasure and maybe next year when uh, we'll be uh, able to travel you can come to Mauritius for next uh, event <laughs> thank you Definitely. thanks a lot yeah that would be great thanks a lot babes. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.